Today on Everyday Injustice, we are joined by Senator Dave Cortese. Senator Cortese represents much of Santa Clara County in the State Senate. Welcome, Senator. Hi, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Um, so we focus heavily uh, in this podcast on criminal justice reform. And I was wondering where you see things heading right now, where there seems to be a bit of a pushback on some of the reforms and there's media account on rising crime, whether it's uh, retail theft or murder, um, is momentum for reform stalling at this point? Um, I haven't you know, seen any um, direct evidence of, of momentum slowing down or, or people changing course. Um, however, we'll have a better idea of that after the first of the year in terms of the, of the state legislature, you know, as. As a state senator, um, I can't introduce a new bill until January 3rd, and that's the same for all of my colleagues, including those in the assembly. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether or not there's a drop off in introduced legislation, you know, on things like sentencing reform or juvenile diversion or uh, whatever the case may be, um, including police reform. Obviously, last year's SB2 was a step in the right direction in terms of police reform. Um, if there if there is momentum to continue in that direction, I think you would see, you know, another couple of major bills, and it'll 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 be interesting to see, if not, um, and you know, uh, all the things that you cited certainly weigh on on legislators because um, the public, you know, based on forty Senate districts and eighty Assembly districts, um, whatever those end up looking like here, <laughs> we'll know in the next couple of weeks. Um, but even if you just think of it as 58 counties in California, there's, there's a big state, there's a divergence of opinions. There, there are folks right now in San Francisco probably who are thinking the pendulum swung too far. I don't, but they may think so. Um, but who would have thought anyone in San Francisco would go in that direction, um, you know, if you would have asked that question a couple of years ago? Um, you would think maybe that would be a Central Valley attitude, you know, Kern County or something like that. Um, but we're actually seeing more noise, I think, out of San Francisco, um, you know, in terms of, you know, kind of a pendulum shift, you know, probably than anywhere else. Um, and it, it gets complicated because, as we all know, there's a lot of reasons that this is occurring that have nothing to do with reform and reform legislation, you know, that's occurred in the past. I had a former staffer who still works at the County of Santa Clara, where I was for 12 years before joining the Senate. And the former staffer asked me the question because he was being peppered you know, by a constituent who said, um, you know, because of Prop 47, you, know, you, you can't arrest anyone anymore um, for these smash and grab thefts. You know? And so he wrote me, he said, is that true? And I said, no. I said, they clarified that you know, $950 or less is, is a misdemeanor. In, you can't hang a felony on somebody, um, you know, it's still a crime. It's still somebody can get cited or arrested. Somebody can be prosecuted for that. Someone can spend up to a year in jail for it, you know? So, um, but the, the when the narrative starts confusing local government staff members who have worked for a dozen years <laughs> and they, don't, they aren't sure if, you know, if these constituents who are so sure of themselves um, about the disaster of, you know, of sentencing reform, um, you know, you know, something's amiss, you know, you know that um, whether we lose momentum or not, it's, it's going to be tough sledding ahead, and none of this is ever going to be easy. Yeah, it seems kind of strange, you know, we were just looking this up last week, but, uh, you know, in Texas, the, the line for a felony petty theft is, is 2,500, in California, it's 950. Um, and yet you hear all these concerns about California and you never hear anything about Texas. Yeah, one of the most alarming things that I've heard, um, not institutionally from a police chief, but from police officers who, you know, generally um, on these topics have my respect, you know, in terms of their opinions about, you know, what it's like on the street. You want to listen to them. What are they up against? What are they running into, right? Because you want to keep your finger on the pulse there but you know to, to say that we didn't bother arresting someone because they'll just be released anyway and usually that statement 
is used as an excuse, you know, for some heinous crime that happened. And when everybody checks uh, the history on that individual, you know, he was stopped and released, stopped and released, stopped and released, and then, you know, you know, and then it's something bad happens. I, I don't mean to, it's not funny. I didn't mean to, to laugh about that, but laughing at the, the excuse coming in after the fact, you know, um, hey, that's not our fault. You know, people say, why didn't you, why didn't you bring that individual in? Maybe you need mental health treatment or something. You know, somebody could have done something to intervene. Um, well, why should we? You know, they're just going to be released. He's just going to be released. You know, there's this defeatist attitude. And um, I think that probably is the thing we need to get beyond quickly, whether it's juvenile justice reform or adult justice reform is this defeatist attitude, this idea that, um, you know, rehabilitation never works, you know, that there's never enough mental health treatment that, you know, people are inherently evil. Um, it, it's hard to imagine that there isn't such a thing as people who are inherently evil. Um, I, I'm not trying to erase that conceptually <laughs> or just say it doesn't exist at all, but that label gets slapped on, on folks, um, that word, you know, who, and kids and young people, you know, who made the, what might be the worst mistake of their life at 15 years old and essentially are facing a system that wants them to pay for that one mistake for the rest of their life. Um, when so many of us get a chance to not make that mistake again and go on with our lives, you know, it's a double standard really. Um, and, and, and it comes from a defeatist attitude. I think, you know, where so many of, of, of our constituents or members of the public are saying, um, why would you try to divert that 15 year old? Why would you try to get them help? You know, he or she is an evil person. They're always gonna be like that. The best thing you can do is lock them up and keep them off the street. Um, that's, I think that's a horrible approach to, to society, you know, let, let alone the justice system. Um, to say that any one of us should have to pay for the rest of our lives for the one worst mistake we ever made. I think we'd all be locked up. Um, and if not locked up, we would certainly, a lot of us would certainly, um, you know, be at least, um, at least conceptually locked up, you know, locked up in, this, in, the, in the sense of opportunity for advancement, opportunity, you know, to, to move on with life, to clear your record, you know, to, uh, to go get a college degree or to get a job, you know, working for the county or someplace like that. Um, those things in the past have been very, very difficult for people, you know, who had to check off that box. Yes, you know, I was arrested once. Um, I'm an attorney. I mean, try becoming an attorney. You know, you could do all the work you're supposed to do, have a stellar performance. You go to school for three or four years, pass the bar the first time, uh, basically work your ass off, um, and then, you know, basically have the state bar tell you that something that you did when you were 19 um, is going to, you know, cause them to, to deny you the ethics pass you need to actually practice law. Um, and you don't get that answer until then. <laughs> it's not like you can pre-qualify before you go to law school. They don't even want to talk to you until they see that you already did all that work and pass the bar exam. Um, and, and again, I'm not throwing them under the bus. I'm not trashing them. I think they're probably generally fair. They were, you know, I didn't have a problem with them. And, you know, I, I will tell you that um, I made mistakes when I was young, but it, it, it scares the hell out of people, you know, that um, uh, that's some one or two people or, you know, in an institution somewhere can essentially shatter your entire life, essentially forever for the rest of your life, uh, you know, just by making that call one way or the other as to whether or not, you know, society should, should trust you and, uh, you know, uh, it's all part of kind of a defeatist, an overall overarching defeatist attitude. We have a negative attitude. We have sometimes about the human propensity to, uh, to, to redeem, to redeem. I saw, um, I was reading uh, a book this weekend and a very interesting um, 
statistic. Um, the vast majority of people um, that offend when they're a juvenile end up not offending as an adult, but the vast majority of adult offenders offended as a juvenile. So it seems like uh, we're, you know, most people who offend kind of get over it, they, they grow out of it, but um, you know, there, there's a subsection of people that, you know, once they start offending, they end up in the system and they can't get out of it. Yeah, there's something that's, um, that's not paid enough attention, and that is recidivism. And I know that word, everyone knows what it is. It's been around forever. It's essentially been assigned like a blanket you know, to anyone incarcerated, right, including juveniles. But it actually, to your point, exists with, with a, a fraction of, of the incarcerated population, ultimately, especially youth. And, you know, we used to have, when I joined the, the Board of Supervisors in Santa Clara County, there were over 300 youth incarcerated in juvenile hall. So I became board president, and I made an announcement that we're going to put juvenile hall out of business. Now, not to be um, misinterpreted as we're going to shut juvenile hall down tomorrow. We're going to put it out of business because that juvenile hall uh, was basically assuming that all 300 of those kids were high risk for recidivism unless they were, you know, put through the paces for 30 days, um, 60 days, somehow rehabilitated um, in juvenile hall and then, you know, released right back onto the streets without a mentor, you know, without, you um, wraparound services, you know, just, okay, go back to your neighborhood now. Well, out of those 300, there were commonly about 10 kids, 10, not 110, not 210, 10 out of 300, who, if you looked at their rap sheet, were, had been in there six, seven, eight times. The rest of them were almost all one-timers, okay? Those eight, if you release them, in 30 days without the mentor, without the wraparound services into their old neighborhood, into a gang neighborhood, into a place where they had already been recruited and, and are sort of subject to, to gang culture, um, they're screwed, we're screwed, okay? Of course, they're gonna go from 15, 16, 17, 18 and essentially become an adult felon at that point in all likelihood, um, eight, or, eight or 10 stops in juvenile hall. I mean, that's, that's, that's gonna keep going on. So when I say, we don't pay enough attention to it on both sides where there isn't really a high propensity for recidivism. You know, there's family support, there's a willingness to do restorative justice, there's a, there's a willing to, willingness to make amends to the community, to do restitution. Um, those, those kids aren't likely to come back, okay? Where you have a kid who's already in this pattern of, of bouncing right back into juvenile hall, we need to pounce on that and we need to interrupt that pattern or disrupt that pattern. And, um, and that doesn't happen in, in most counties, um, even in a relatively progressive county like Santa Clara County, you know, there's this fear of, well, what do we do? Just release them back? Um, so we want to try to keep them longer. You know, um, we're going to start treating them as on a point system as the highest level of evil or, or propensity to hurt somebody. Well, some of that might be, might be accurate, but the real question is once you point them out, <laughs> once you come to that conclusion that they're high risk, really high risk, um, and a danger perhaps even to those in their own neighborhood, what are you doing about it? You know, ultimately they all get, and maybe they keep them an extra 30 days and keep them 90 days, you're still releasing them right back out. So, you know, not enough is done. And like I said, if that's happening in Santa Clara County without naming any other counties, my belief is, you know, in more conservative um, sort of old school kind of lock them up uh, communities uh, or in places where, you know, especially outside of California where they're, they're contracting out the prison system, I mean, those, those kids don't stand a chance. They're, no one's disrupting their, their pattern of behavior. No one's putting them through whatever they need, stabilization, 12-step programs you know, for youth, um, uh, uh, mental health issues. I mean, you could, you could have a kid 
involve in uh, gang culture in our community that's also got significant mental health issues and perhaps that's you know what caused them to uh, drop out of school in the first place um, to you know to to have anger management issues what are anger management issues to me they're a symptom of some underlying mental health problem um, yet what are we doing in terms of getting mental health you know treatment uh, long term you know for that young person um, shouldn't that shouldn't all of that be an answer the real answer to our fears you know we, we fear this youth that's that's okay that's healthy what, what this youth might do, but what are we doing about it, right? Um, and, you know, that's, um, all that goes back to those numbers that you're talking about. Um, so those eight or 10 out of 300, if they move on to state prison a couple of years later, those are big numbers. I mean, those are, the, that's fueling the state prison system because there you're not talking about it's a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day stay. You're talking about over a year you know, or over 10 years, or as we've seen in some of the legislation we've done, LWAP, you know, that kid goes back out, is riding in a car, you know, with uh, two organized crime members, they jump out, uh, you know, they get in a scuffle in a liquor store, they kill somebody, you know, that kid's got a rap sheet already from juvenile hall, now they want to try him as an adult, you know, boom, 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 the pieces start, the whole thing starts to unravel. And now you've got 19 year old, a 19 year old average age uh, for special circumstances murders, um, you know, on, on LWAP, on life without parole. And there's- well, Let me ask you, um, you know, as a legislator, it seems like you understand this problem pretty well, pretty articulate on it. Uh, what can you do about it? Uh, you know, back to, we can't let any slowdown in, you know, perceived momentum or temporary swings in the pendulum, you know, in terms of public opinion, um, you know, dissuade us from, I think, doing the gutsy thing is, is to keep bringing legislation forward and keep bringing, um, you know, keep, keep putting our best foot forward legislatively to, to correct some of these things. And, and, and also don't, let's not forget, you know, you can control a lot of things without just straight up legislation through through the budget. And if the budget, and I think this governor is willing to do that, and if the budget, the state budget um, is, begins to, to be more organized in rewarding counties, which are um, emphasizing, you know, real uh, redemption, real transformational work with young people, um, that's the best answer for slowing down this, um, this prison pipeline, I think, um, you know, it's right back to those numbers you're talking about. Most of them in the state prison were there at juvenile hall. Well, there's literally our captive audience. What are we doing to divert them at that point? And, and some of that is, I, I, don't, I don't mean to say throw money at the problem, but if we can change local behavior or reward, you know, local, uh, the local willingness uh, to install um, restorative justice programs, diversion programs, you know, um, you know, to, to create investment. I will tell you as a former county supervisor, there's a hell of a temptation when you're at a county if the state is dangling money and saying you can have this money if you do this. There's a hell of a, uh, there's a, hell of a temptation to say, I'll take it, you know, uh, because uh, you're dealing with, especially in some of these counties, very scarce resources. So I, I think that's, you know, we don't always have to get 21 votes in the Senate or, or, you know, 41 votes in the assembly. You know, I think when you have an administration like this that has shown some willingness uh, in the governor's office, you know, to, to push these kind of reforms, uh, especially at the juvenile level. I mean, he signed my bill, SB 383, um, you know, last September, which was a straight up juvenile diversion bill. Um, what else are we doing? Are we turning juvenile, are we rewarding counties for investing in mental health facilities instead of juvenile hall facilities for a lot of these youth? You know, are we doing that? No, but could we do that? Yes. Would a lot of those counties grab that money and start building mental health facilities for juvenile intervention? Probably. Um, and we have billions right now to work with in terms of infrastructure money. Um, so 
I think that's the kind of thing we have to think about what, what we have to do. And we have to hope that, you know, the governor who frankly has a thousand more power, <laughs> more a thousand times more power than I do, or, or that the Senate does, you know, is, is willing to put um, uh, funding incentives in place to get some of this transformational work done. Um, and then shifting a little bit to uh, SB 300, um, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, SB 300 is, is a bill that um, does uh, kind of go after um, inequities in what we call um, uh, special circumstances, felony murder special circumstances. Uh, felony murder itself, as you know, but I'm, some of the listeners may not know, is basically sort of a transferred intent theory when it comes to, to murder. Okay, if you go in and you had the intent to um, pummel somebody with your fists, you didn't really intend to murder them, but they died from that, from those injuries. That's called felony murder. You were, you were intending to commit a felony, a dangerous felony, and somebody died. So you get the murder rap. Special circumstances basically says if you were along for the ride, you know, not a conspirator, but if you were an accessory, meaning you were somewhere in that cohort, maybe you were in the car waiting for you know, two perpetrators to come back out of a liquor store or something like that. Maybe you were a prostitute being trafficked by the perpetrators um, and you're just waiting in the car. Um, maybe you're um, an 18 year old who's um, intimidated and, and fearful to run away. It doesn't matter. Special circumstances basically says that if the DA charges you, you who were sitting outside the crime, who had no intent to beat someone up or do a dangerous felony, let alone kill someone, you were just out there waiting. Um, but if the DA charges you under the special circumstances provision, then the jury, if they factually find you as an accessory, has no choice to give you um, life without parole. I'm sorry, the judge has no choice if the jury agrees with the DA that you were an accessory to give you life without parole or a death sentence. Uh, so the average age of individuals in prison right now under that special circumstances wrap is 19. Two thirds of them are people of color, um, people who in the neighborhoods we would call communities of concern who would fit into most disadvantaged community frameworks. Um, that's what caught my attention is the, uh, the statistics first. Somebody pointed out to me who's actually, you know, what the outcomes are, who's actually on death row, who's actually in LWAP. And I said, that's, that's, those, those are, are um, racially discriminatory outcomes. I, whatever the whatever the plan was for this law, it couldn't possibly have been to systematically lock up 19-year-old persons of color. It, it, that, that's skewed. It's, it can't be. When you get racial outcomes with a law, um, you need to go unravel that. You need to make adjustments. You need to figure out even if this is a good law, what needs to be done to to unskew um, what's happening here. So we started to look at it and we introduced a bill, I introduced a bill called SB 300, um, which, which goes in and, and, and tries to fix that by saying, look, if you didn't have the actual intent um, to, to do this dangerous felony or to murder somebody, um, then you can't be charged, you can't be sentenced to life without parole or the death penalty. You could still, under my bill, take the rap for murder. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand that when they look at the bill, even some of my colleagues said, well, I think they should still be, you know, they should still be guilty. You know, they should still be found guilty. They should still, I mean, if they were in the car, they probably knew what was going on. They didn't run away. Why wouldn't they get charged with murder as well? Now, our bill says, be that as it may, LWAP, life without parole, no possibility of parole or death penalty, 
that means it, you know, because the DA charged it, this person is now never going to come home alive ever, you know, to their, literally to their home, to their mother, their father, their children, whatever the case may be, their wife, it's just not going to happen. There's not an opportunity to even plead your case um, to a judge and say, I've been good in prison for 20 years or, or a pro board. Um, it just doesn't exist. And that's what we're trying to correct is that the judges have discretion. Once they've heard the entire case, they're, they come in all varieties, right? Um, if, they, if they say, hey, look, there was domestic violence going on. There's testimony here that the perpetrators told this young woman, 19-year-old woman, if you don't stay in the car, we'll kill you, okay? Um, stay right here, okay? Um, there's testimony and evidence that she knew nothing of what they were going to do inside the building they went into. Um, they come out having murdered somebody. The judge should be able to take those facts into account and say, whatever sentence I give you is going to be adjusted for your lack of intent in these circumstances. Maybe you're guilty of special circumstances. You shouldn't have been with these guys in the first place. You, you knew they were going to do something wrong. And that's why, and you were in the car complicit in bad behavior, but you didn't have the intent to kill. Um, and that's clear in the facts. And again, perhaps a judge may say there was enough evidence here that, that she was being coerced, at least, at least enough evidence for me to mitigate her sentence, right? That mitigation of the sentence cannot happen under current law. So we think this is, is actually <laughs> modest sentencing reform. It's not modest when you look at the fact that it may get somebody out of prison in 30 or 40 years that can then resume their life. That's profound. But we don't think it's, we think it's modest in terms of what we're asking the legislature to correct. It's just not possible that in every single factual circumstances <laughs> that somebody deserves life without parole. It's just not possible. Nothing ever happens 100% of the time and, you know, when, you're, when you're weighing out facts. So, um, so we were able to get that bill um, off the floor of the Senate, barely. It needed a super majority. It needed a two thirds vote. And the reason is because the original law came out of a, a referendum. And, um, you know, so the bill is moving along. We have high hopes for it getting out of the assembly now that we're into the sec coming into the second year of the session. But it is going to take, you see, well, let me pause and just say there are no sound bites on this, right? I mean, I just spent seven or eight minutes explaining the most important part of the bill to you. Um, legislators could easily misunderstand it. There's 80 people that need to hear this over in the assembly. Um, and certainly there'll be a, a huge effort to try to educate them all as to what we're really trying to do. But, you know, misunderstandings abound. And, and people, if they're nervous and they don't understand, sometimes they'll just stay off the bill. That means they won't vote yes or no. Um, and you kind of have to respect that you know, I was always brought up in, in my early business days to say, if I don't understand what you're pitching, the best answer for me to say right now is no. You know, if you want to come back tomorrow and pitch me again, I might become educated enough to give you a yes. But right now I'm confused. I, I don't I don't have I don't have a yes answer for you. I don't have a yes or a no. And if you keep pushing me, I'm just going to say no. You know, that happens in the legislature, too. People don't want to make a mistake. And back to the thing about the pendulum swing and the momentum and what's happening in terms of criminal reform right now. I mean, some of my colleagues are in districts that have much less tolerance for sentencing reform right now than maybe my district does. You know, in Santa Clara County, we would probably have passed this bill um, on any given Tuesday at the Board of Supervisors if we had the power to do it. But there's 57 other counties and they don't all have the same attitudes. That's what you know, makes um, makes it so fascinating and interesting to try to get stuff done in California. It's really interesting, and I know we're uh, almost out of time here. But you know, I'm I'm an old death penalty opponent, and mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, when I was younger, um, the alternative to the death penalty was life without parole. And I've really come to the point where I don't think life without parole is a good option either because it's basically sentencing somebody to die in prison instead of, uh, you know, the electric chair or the gas chamber. Um, and it, it just seems like, you know, we can make much better decisions as to whether or not somebody should be released in, in real time as opposed to try to predict it when they're 19 years old. I, I mean, how do we know you know, who's going to respond well to, to years in prison and who's going to be ready to be released at what point in time. It just seems like the whole system doesn't make a lot of sense, yeah. even beyond the point that, that you're making. Yeah, you know, it was Cesar Chavez who said, and, and I paraphrase, you know, once you, un, once you educate someone, you can't uneducate them. And once somebody's redeemed, you can't unredeem them. Um, and you know the purpose of opposing the death penalty for most people is that time and time again, we determine later that mistakes occurred, the wrong person, um, you know, the accused was not the perpetrator in the first place. Um, but what about those cases where redemption happens, right? Uh, you know, we have to believe, and this goes back to the defeatist attitude, that redemption can occur. It can occur. And it does occur. It happens all around us. It happens in our families. Um, you know, the, the person who was an addict who, um, who stays, you know, away from their addiction for the rest of their lives because, um, because, because they're, they're now redeemed, because they transformed, they did the things necessary. Uh, I grew up in East San Jose, and I will tell you, I had as many friends when I look back you know, in my local community, my local society, that could have proved to somebody um, in their individual circumstance that you shouldn't trust somebody to have a propensity to be redeemed because they kept, you know, they were in that recidivism group. They kept going in the wrong direction. They kept going in the wrong direction. I will tell you that there are almost as many, though, as I could point out in that same community who went in the right direction, who um, matured, you know, uh, who got past the age of 25, 26, 27, and whether it was brain development or education, that's why I said that, um, you know, something got to them and they turned, you know, back onto the right path. So a 19 year old, you know, that's six or seven years still away from full brain development that gets put away for life without no possibility of parole, a sentence beyond you know, what even an assassin had got in the state of California, when you look at Sirhan Sirhan, at least a, 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 um, a pled out assassin, you know, it doesn't make any sense um, to lump everyone into the category, like I said, of unredeemable. It just doesn't. That's not our experience in life. It's not our experience in our families. It's not our experience in our local communities. It's not our experience with the kids we went to school with. You know, why would it be the experience only with those in prison. <laughs> it, it, it isn't there either. Uh, so we're squandering a, a lot of what could be productive lives and healthy lives and um, in maybe an opportunity for them to regenerate in society, regenerate their own families and be of service to people. We're cutting all of that short and, and that hurts all of us. You know, every time we do that, we're cheating ourselves. And that's, I think, where people I think that's where we need to continue to educate our society. Um, that when we talk about sentencing reform, it's it's not just about the idea that we may be cheating somebody who's incarcerated now um, by not reforming their sentence, but we're cheating all of society if indeed you know we have redeemed human beings um, who could be you know adding something positive. To the greater society that that hurts all of us well we're we're just about out of time i wanted to thank you for uh coming on and taking time out of your very busy schedule to uh have this great conversation thank you thank you appreciate all that you do um david and the vanguard does in terms of you know educating people and getting the word out um i wish we had you know 200 more um organizations like yours that are that are willing to, to publish the truth. So thank you very much for that.
This has been Everyday Injustice. We've been talking with Senator Dave Cortese from Santa Clara County, uh, talking about uh, some of his legislation and uh, where things are going. Join us again next time for more tales from our injustice system.